Sauropods do not raise their young. They lay their eggs, abandon them, and leave the young to fend for themselves. Here in the early Cretaceous of Utah, it is no different, especially for the largest sauropod species in the area, Sidarosaurus. As adults, they can grow to 15 meters long, and their long necks can reach up to 8 meters high, in order to feed on some of the tallest trees. Yet when they hatch, they are no longer than 30 centimeters, and have to spend the first years of their lives eating, growing, and hiding. As just about anything will hunt them from Gemini Raptor to Martha Raptor. But sauropods grow quickly, and they soon become too large for small predators. But a larger body means it's more difficult to hide, and as adolescents, they are common prey for Utah Raptor, that can grow up to 6 meters long, and weigh 500 kilograms. Once they reach a certain size, they have to find an adult herd for protection, and begin the rest of their lives on the move. But adult herds won't just allow any youngster to join them. They have to be large enough for two reasons. First, if they are too small, an adult may walk into them or even trample them before realizing they are there. And secondly, they have to be able to keep up with the adults, be it over vast lowlands, flooded rivers, or running from predators. For two young Sidarosaurus, they are in desperate need of the protection an adult herd would provide. They have been separated from their group, and reduced from an original number of six by predators, and one of them falling off a cliff. They have been wandering the edges of the forests, hoping to find any sign of adult Sidarosaurus, while also trying to remain hidden from predators as best they can. Waking up to another day, the four meter tall adolescents sense that they may be in luck, detecting the faint vibrations through the ground that are from some kind of sauropod. Getting up and moving toward the sound, they see in the distance that they are not just sauropods, but the ones they have been looking for, a full Sidarosaurus herd. They are just under a kilometer away, and the juveniles start walking at a quickened pace, their eagerness to join the herd, overriding caution. Moving into the open areas, they are far more at risk, but they have to at least be seen by the herd, so the adults can judge them. As they walk, one of the youngsters lets out a loud bellow, an act meant to get the herd's attention, but accidentally alerts everyone in the area as well. Soon after, the two Sidarosaurus hear barking and high-pitched whistles coming from behind them, Calls they are all too familiar with. Utah Raptor. The young sauropod's call has alerted a nearby pack that has been scouting the area, and they knew the large dromaeosaurs were heading their way. The foliage behind them started to move, and right after, a full pack of Utah Raptors burst out already in full sprint, calling to each other and forming up to attack. The Sidarosaurus pair began to run as fast as they could calling out to the herd that was so close, but not close enough. The Utah Raptors were much faster than the young sauropods, and the lead juvenile saw his sibling lurch to the side, and then begin to cry out as the predators pounced on her, and pulled her to the ground. Unable to do anything for her, the last Sidarosaurus kept running, seeing the adults' heads were turning to look directly at him, but they were still so far away. Four young adult Utah Raptors surrounded the last Sidarosaurus. One bit into his tail and pulled back, driving his feet into the ground. Two tackled him from the side, and with their combined weight pushed him over. He crashed into the ground and slid along the dry earth. Trying to rise, he was soon overwhelmed as the coordinated siblings leapt upon him and sunk their sickle claws into his hide. He tried to kick them, but the dromaeosaurs were quick and one of them wrapped its arms around his neck and bit down, right below the base of his skull. These Uteruptors were skilled and efficient. This meant that instead of being cut and punctured till blood loss set in, he had a mercifully quick death. The adult herd looked on and then changed their course to go around the pack that were already beginning to pick apart the unlucky juveniles. They had no reason now to get close to so many powerful predators. Hello fellow travelers and welcome back. 
Today we will be breaking down the largest sauropod from the Sedare Mountain Formation, Sedarosaurus. Sedarosaurus's first remains were discovered in 1996 in Utah and was described and named in 1999 after the formation was found. It lived during the early Cretaceous between 139 and 134 million years ago. Sedarosaurus is a sauropod in the Macronaria clade. More specifically, it belongs to the Brachiosauridae family and is quite closely related to Brachiosaurus itself. In life, Sedarosaurus grew to 15 meters long, stood 8 meters tall, and weighed between 10 and 11 tons, with some sources putting its weight closer to 20 tons. This makes it medium size for a Brachiosaurid. We have a fair amount of its skeleton, which is how scientists were able to quickly assign it to its own genus. It has many similarities to its close relative, Venosaurus. However, Sedarosaurus's ulna and radius are more gracile, and it lived earlier. Sedarosaurus also has less developed lateral fossa in its vertebra, a feature Venenosaurus is known for. Given its elongated forelimbs and long neck, it's no doubt that Sedarosaurus was a high browser, feeding from the tallest trees that not even other sauropods it lived alongside could reach. On the subject of feeding, the Sedarosaurus skeleton was noted to have 115 gastroliths associated with it. Gastroliths are stones an animal has swallowed to aid in digestion, and the ones found on Sedarosaurus came in all shapes and sizes, altogether weighing up to 7 kilograms. They are identifiable as gastroliths because of their tight spatial distribution, partial matrix support, and their high surface reflection values that are consistent with other known dinosaur gastroliths. Now there is of course a theory that sauropods may have swallowed these stones on accident while feeding based on the fact that they weren't particularly bright. And that may have happened on occasion, as the majority of the rocks are around 10 millimeters in volume. But some were so large they were stated to have been difficult for the animal to swallow, so it was definitely selecting them on purpose. All these stones would have helped grind down the plants Sidarosaurus ate, quickening the digestive process, and it may have gained some extra minerals from the rocks as its digestive fluids gradually wore them down. Whether they stayed in the digestive system forever, or were passed through, or were regurgitated up, isn't known. Interestingly enough, some of the gastroliths found contain fossils of their own. Sidarosaurus was a massive animal, and it likely didn't have many frats once it reached full size. It is an important discovery, showing us how the Brachiosauridae family continued after the Jurassic, and another reminder that these large sauropods were just about everywhere during the Cretaceous. Well, what do you think of Sidarosaurus? And for my question of the week, do you think that Sidarosaurus was under threat from Utah Raptor? Or do you believe only something like an Acrocanthrosaurus was capable of taking it down? What lesser known dinosaur would you like me to do a breakdown on next? And until then, please like, share, subscribe, and please enjoy the rest of the narrative section. Strider and his brothers had performed well. Roughguts had done his usual move of pulling the tail. Blackpack and Thrasher had tackled and pinned the target. And finally, Strider had delivered the killing blow. This had been a well-executed attack that had resulted in no injuries for the siblings. The other members of the Blades pack had taken down the slowest Derosaurus, and the Alphas of the group, Claymore and Nadoshi, had complimented both groups on their success. Usually the Alphas, and then the members under them, would feed first, but the two kills were large enough that most of the pack could feed together, though Strider and his brothers did have to wait, though it wasn't as long this time. Now trusted with regular hunts and getting good quality meat, the siblings had grown to full size and had relished the strength that came with adulthood. Ironically, it was Strider, the runt of the litter, that had grown the most, and he was now arguably the largest of the four. Having eaten his fill, Strider looked over this pack that was becoming more and more like a family to him. He was integrating at a steady pace, though technically they were still only just above the infants and juveniles. 
But if things kept going well, he and his brothers would no longer be seen as outsiders. He breathed in the morning air, and caught the scent of something close by, but he couldn't tell what it was. Curiosity got the better of him, and he followed the smell, walking through his new home for some time, until eventually he came to the very edge of the Blade's territory. This is where he would have stopped, but he was on the boundary of the Red Claw Pack territory, his pack of birth. He had no doubt that if he crossed he would be seen as a trespasser by his old family, and may even be seen as a deserter by the Blades. But that scent was nagging him, and he could tell the source was quite close. Strider pressed on, he had to know what it was, but he also knew he had to be quick. Following the scent, he winded through trees and slipped through bushes, trying to make as little noise as possible. The smell was very strong now, and as he rounded a rock, he finally saw the source, and why it was so familiar. It was one eye, his former pack alpha male, and he was dead. Strider simply stared at the body in silence. The scent was familiar because it was one eye's scent, but he didn't recognize it because he had been dead for days. He barely recognized him, all flat and decayed. Strider knew he didn't die in a hunt. By his injuries, it seemed like he had been killed by another Utah Raptor. A fight for dominance, perhaps? It seemed likely. One Eye had been getting older and slower, but he had always been a patient and wise leader for as long as Strider could remember. He wondered who had killed him. What had happened to the alpha female Red Claw? Had the power structure completely changed in his old pack? Was Swift Tail okay? He wanted to know, but also knew he had been gone for too long, and reluctantly, began to run back to his new family. Not sure whether to tell his brothers of this, but also hoping his old family were dealing with the death of their alpha as well as they could, pondering if any of this should even concern him any more.